Okay, so where did we leave off? We talked about stages of disease. And we talked about reservoirs. Yes, no? Almost, okay. The second part of what, Stephanie? That's what I'm trying to find, where we left stentifos. Thank you, is the slide before. Okay. Okay, so extent of host involvement. Uh, in uh, host involvement, of course, toxemia means there's toxins in the blood, viremia means viruses. But when we talk about extent of host involvement, um, a few terms that, that are used uh, float around here. Uh, in a primary infection, that's an acute infection. So you first get sick and then you start to feel signs and symptoms, that's referred to as an acute stage illness. In secondary infection, this is an opportunistic. This is oftentimes where our own normal flora will, um, will start to cause an infection or disease state because you were already sick um, on some, with something else. Stephanie, I will answer the question after the lecture. I, I need to get the lecture done and then I'll help you find it. Uh, so in the secondary infection, uh, it, that's when you have um, that's when you have another organism coming in and causing a second infection. It's usually worse than a primary infection. A really great example of it is when if you have a child, this happens in kids quite a bit. When you have a young child, usually toddler age, maybe a little bit older, their uh, their eustachian tubes are incredibly small and very very narrow. And the child may get a cold, so they get an upper respiratory infection. But that upper respiratory infection causes a lot of mucus formation, and you know they get a stuffy, runny nose, and this causes a lot of swelling in the upper airway. That swelling puts pressure on the eustachian tubes, and the fluid in there does have normal bacteria in it, but those eustachian tubes will get closed off. They'll get kind of pinched or, or kind of smashed down and now the ears will not drain and when the ears do not drain properly then bacteria that's in that fluid begins to overgrow and it turns into a secondary ear so a lot of children will have a, a viral infection but they end up with a secondary bacterial infection in the inner ear and that would be considered a secondary infection the first the first infection usually the cold is not that big a deal um, and would go away in a few days, but then you end up having to go to the doctor because the child has a really bad ear infection. <clears throat> in subclinical disease, there's no noticeable signs or symptoms. This would be a disease that usually is diagnosed um, <clears throat> as a secondary finding. Hepatitis, oftentimes uh, earlier stage uh, hepatitis, there's no signs or symptoms. Uh, early stage polio, no signs or symptoms. There are some children back in the polio outbreak that were asymptomatic the, the entire time. Um, the herpes virus is the same way. Someone can be asymptomatic, uh, and so they have no idea that they're carrying herpes. And as we're now learning here in COVID-19, COVID-19 can have a subclinical presentation, so people can be asymptomatic. And the problem with that with a contagious disease like COVID is they can uh, transmit that disease. Now, in addition to... Uh, different factors in a disease state, uh, as in, in humans and in nature, we have what are called, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, predisposing factors. Some of these are factors we can control and some of them are not. But predisposing factors do play a really role in epidemiology because we have to distinguish um, those who have predisposing factors from those who do not because predisposing factors oftentimes make someone much more susceptible to disease. So, um, for women, just simply the physical uh, the physical trait of having a short urethra, and this is why more women have uh, urinary tract infections, have UTs than males do. Uh, you can have an inherited trait, such as the sickle cell gene, which can weaken the ability of the body to move oxygen to the organs, and this can, of course, predispose someone. Climate and weather. If you live in a really cold, rainy, or snowy place, you're gonna spend a lot more time indoors. Maintaining your body temperature in colder weather is taxing for the body. It requires a lot more energy. This is why uh, um, if anybody ever lived in really snowy, cold areas, in the winter time, you wanna eat uh, really uh, uh, calorie dense foods. 
And the reason for that is because your body needs all of those calories, those extra calories to help maintain your body temperature in the colder weather. So uh, climate and weather can play a role. Those uh, really cold, rainy, um, or snowy type areas, you're spending a lot more time indoors, so you are exposed to a lot of diseases more often. Um, and your body is already taxed and spent a lot of energy to maintain your body temperature in colder weather, so uh, it can predispose you. Fatigue is a really big one. Um, most students, usually in class, I ask for a raise of hands for everybody that gets um, that gets some kind of uh, fatigue or, or a little bit of illness at the end of a term, about three or four days after finals, all of a sudden you're like, man, I am just wiped. And that's usually fatigue. And you've been in a heightened kind of state. Um, a lot of people right now, as a matter of fact, are starting to feel the effects of fatigue because they are feeling the effects of high stress levels. All those high cortisol levels and uh, stress hormone levels are really starting to get to people and um, it does predispose you. It is, it's taxing on the immune system, it's taxing on your overall uh, circulatory system and your body is a little weakened. So fatigue is a really big problem. Um, most people are walking around with some type of chronic fatigue and it's usually due to stress and doing too much. So this whole quarantine situation, um, although we are at home and we're resting and everyone's thinking, oh, I'm spending more time with my family, I'm doing all these things that I should have been doing, but at the same time, we're at this really extremely high stress level. Uh, so uh, the trick will be when this quarantine is lifted and we go back to work that we still continue to do some of the things here um, at home that um, we've been we've been uh, reconnected with to help with that fatigue level. Age of course is always a predisposing factor the older you are the weaker your immune system becomes so age is a simple is a pretty easy one to understand but this also uh, age applies to infants remember infants are um, their, their immune system is immature and also they are unexposed to anything. So they are high, they're much more susceptible to disease than, than your average adult. Lifestyle and lifestyle choices, smoking, diet, um, uh, career choice, all of those different things, lifestyle choices do make a difference and can predispose, uh, can predispose someone to disease. If you're working 24 seven, um, and you're totally stressed out, you eventually are going to uh, kind of crash and burn. You're going to hit a wall. And usually that manifests itself in some type of physical illness. Chemotherapy, if you are on treatment for another disease, this can make you highly susceptible um, and, make, and predispose you to many diseases. Many medications out there now um, are symptomatic medications. They're treating symptoms of disease and not necessarily the mechanism. And those, those are usually anti-inflammatories um, and they're immunosuppressive uh, drugs. So starting to suppress the immune system to prevent the signs and symptoms of, say, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you are also opening yourself up for uh, susceptibility to bacterial and viral infections because your immune system is being suppressed. And of course, your current health status. Current health status, if your body is busy fighting one disease, it may not be be able to dedicate enough resources to fight another disease that may be introduced into the body. So current health status is, um, uh, uh, yes, Desreen, uh, current health status is a, is a major predisposing factor. We hear about it all the time, but now actually in this COVID, we see, of course, um, and somebody who contracts the COVID virus but has pre-existing conditions is at a much higher risk for a much more uh, severe illness. Uh, my own father is a super high risk category and he's not even allowed to leave the house. He's like, nope, you can sit in the backyard and that's about it. Um, he, he cannot leave the house because he is diabetic and strokes and blood thinners and all, he's on all kinds of different things. So current health status is probably one of the largest predisposing factors. And some of those, um, those factors we can control and some of them we cannot. So in the stages of disease, we've talked about these before in other units, but in terms of um, epidemiology, I just want to add um, another uh, category here. So the incubation period. In the incubation period, we've been exposed, right? Here they're saying number of microbes. You could say number of viruses if you wanted to, right? So we could change this to, uh, we could change this to viruses, so viral load. 
mice. So we have the number of viruses, number of microbes. But when you first expose, that's an incubation period. And I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with that, right? And this will vary from one organism to another or one virus to another. So it is going to be pathogen specific. Uh, some incubation periods are one to three days. Some incubation periods are five to 10 days, uh, three to six. We're seeing with the COVID, they really don't have a true incubation period yet. Um, they're estimating, um, I read an article the other day that they estimated in China it was 11.5 days was the average incubation period before signs and symptoms showed up. That's why it's a two week quarantine. And it was ranging anywhere from about um, six days upwards to 12 to 13 days. So by instilling a 14 day period, they've covered the majority of um, possible incubation periods. And that's why the self quarantine was designated for 14 days because that was considered covering the entire incubation period. And if you covered that incubation period and no signs or symptoms showed up, then it was safe for you to, um, to resume your normal life. Prodromal period is where you see mild signs or symptoms. And this is where um, you, people can run into trouble. So in a prodromal period, if this were the flu or um, uh, 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 another type of disease. This is when you're kind of you wake up in the morning or you're sitting there watching TV and all of a sudden you say to yourself, wow, man, I don't feel very good. I think I'm running a little fever or my throat. You wake up and your throat's a little sore, but you're able to go about your day. So a prodromal period is when your signs and symptoms are really mild. You notice them, but they're not quite um, bad enough to necessarily warrant that you you have an illness. Now, the problem with that, like our in our COVID situation, is that um, the signs and symptoms of, of a COVID infection very much mimic flu or a common cold or allergies. And so people can mistake uh, one illness for another. And that's not just in COVID, but that's in uh, many illnesses. Now, how long you're in that prodromal period, it's usually the shortest uh, stage of illness um, because your means your immune system is starting to kick in. So usually maybe a day or a few hours depends on the organism in your immune system. So every patient would be different. But then all of a sudden you move into that period of illness and this is when you start to get worse. And up here at the top of our bell curve here, this is our acute stage of illness. And we're in this acute stage, depending on the organism or pathogen, it could be um, several days, it could be just several hours. Um, but the immune system starts to catch up. And when the immune system and perhaps treatment is starting to reduce the number of vir viruses or uh, uh, microorganism pathogens, we enter into a period of decline. So in decline, you're starting to feel better, but you're not 100%. And then, of course, at the end here, we're trying to get you to a zero viral load or zero pathogen load. Uh, and you're in this what's called period of convalescence. But notice in the period of convalescence, you still have, albeit a low one, you still have a um, viral load or pathogen load. So it's something to keep in mind in period of convalescence that just because you're out of the hospital or your, um, your drug treatment has ended, you really should for a few more days or weeks, depending on the pathogen, take it easy and make sure that you're not um, uh, uh, reinfecting. So that brings us to where do these infections come from, what we call reservoirs of infection. Uh, humans are the largest reservoir of infection uh, because we, we are reservoirs for not only zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted between humans and animals, but we are also reservoirs for human-specific diseases and um, we uh, can uh, carry infections and not even know it. So we have um, HIV, gonorrhea, polio, smallpox. These are all human specific diseases that we are the reservoirs for. So when they eradicated smallpox, smallpox eradication wasn't done by disinfecting water. It wasn't done by um, disinfecting foods or, or anything like that. It was done by um, vaccination. And they vaccinated people all around the world because humans were the only reservoir for smallpox. It is not environmentally transmitted. It is direct contact transmission. So by using the vaccine, vaccination process and treating those with smallpox and scouring every corner of the world to make sure that there were more pox cases, um, they were able to eradicate smallpox from the human population. It is the only disease um, on the planet uh, that we have been able to eradicate out of the human population.
We have animal reservoirs, so rabies, Lyme's disease, Leishmania, these are diseases that we will probably never be able to eradicate simply because um, they are transmitted between animals as well as humans. And so we're, we won't be able to eradicate that disease out of the animal uh, population. Zoonotic diseases, also known as zoonosis, these are diseases like rabies that are transmitted from an animal to a human. Uh, Lyme's disease is vector transmitted. You get this one through a tick. Um, and Leishmania, dogs are the reservoir for Leishmania. Leishmania occurs primarily in the Middle East. And um, that's the, uh, there's a couple of different forms of it, but this is the one that um, it like eats away the cartilage of the nose. Um, and you see people with like big holes in their faces and things like that. Those, those are really extreme cases. But Leishmania occurs mainly over there and dogs are a major reservoir for that disease. Um, it's transmitted by sand flies. So humans get it through sand fly bites, but the sand flies will eat. Uh, will consume their blood-sucking arthropods, and they will uh, have take blood meals off of dogs and humans, so um, they are the vector or the intermediate uh, host. And then we have non-living reservoirs such as water, bodies of water, soil, uh, cholera is transmitted through water, um, uh, other uh, E. coli, when you have sewage spills, things like that, you can have, um, you can have transmission through non-living reservoirs as well. Now, in transmission, there's a couple of different ways that transmission occurs. Uh, we have, of course, direct contact. This is a close association. So here at the bottom, uh, shaking hands, uh, uh, hugging, kissing, uh, direct body contact of any kind. Um, so we have some kind of close association between somebody who's infected and a susceptible host, um, which is uh, what we see with things like um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Now, direct, direct contact in, in, in that sense. Those diseases are a little harder to spread than diseases that are indirect or droplet. So indirect transmission is when, um, is when we have uh, a pathogen can survive on a surface. It's referred to as a fomite. A fomite is just a non-living entity. So doorknobs, elevator buttons, handrails. When organisms or pathogens are left behind by an infected host and are capable of surviving, remaining viable on those surfaces for an extended period of time, this makes it much easier for those uh, pathogens to be spread from one host to another. Next is droplet transmission. Uh, droplet and indirect oftentimes uh, go together because uh, in droplet you can see here we have this uh, typical sneeze, which is really kind of gross. Um, but you can see a sneeze spreads saliva in all distances, all areas, and in pretty good distances. Uh, some high, A big sneeze could transmit a droplet upwards of uh, six to eight feet. Um, so that's why they have that six foot uh, barrier in social distancing. Uh, but uh, transmission is because within the droplets are going to be viruses themselves. And what happens is these droplets land on fomites. And when the droplets land on fomites, we could have a virus that survives, let's say, a shopping cart. You go into the grocery store to use a shopping cart. On the shopping cart handle, if the person leaves the virus behind by normal means, like they touch their face and then they touch the cart, then that would leave a virus, a viroid or a bacteria on the surface of the cart. Let's say that organism may remain or that pathogen may remain viable for three hours. This is primarily with viruses. But if this virus was, um, this person then sneezed and some of the droplets from the sneeze containing virus landed on that shopping cart, well, that could last for anywhere from 24 to 36 hours because the saliva actually protects it for a much longer period of time. <laughs> I don't know about illegal Desrine, but it certainly um, scares people, even though sneezing is not a symptom of COVID. So. Transmission of disease also includes what we call vehicular transmission. This is where there's some type of inanimate reservoir like food or water. Uh, soil is another one, right? Botulism found in soil. Then we have vectors. Uh, these are the blood cell arthropods as well as mechanical transmission from um, vectors. So we have flies, mosquitoes, ticks, mites, um, sand flies, uh, roaches. 
uh, although not many diseases aside from allergies are actually associated with roaches. Um, mostly poor hygiene is associated with roaches, at least the, the German ones. Um, and then we have, uh, so mechanical transmission is when the arthropod does not, is not necessarily a biting arthropod. Like here we have a fly on a hamburger bun. Well, the other place that flies like to hang out is poo. So they may have landed on dog poo before they landed on your hamburger, and they're basically carrying bacteria on these little legs right here, what they call their metatarsals. And uh, these tarsals are covered with sticky little hairs. That's how flies can stick to things. So they carry bacteria and other pathogens on their legs, and when they land on your food, they leave that behind. Um, mechanical transmission by uh, flies is, is pretty difficult to prove, but it can, it does happen. Then we have biological transmission, and this is where the pathogen um, actually carries out part of its life cycle in, inside of the actual vector itself, and the best example of that is plasmodium in, in mosquitoes. And if you remember, plasmodium causes malaria. So without the Anopheles mosquito, the plasmodium pathogen cannot survive and won't, not only will it not be transmitted, but it can't survive because the, the mosquito is a part of the life cycle. Uh, sexual reproduction of the plasmodium uh, pathogen or parasite takes place inside of the mosquito. So that brings us to the concept of nosocomial infections. And nosocomial infections are the result of what I, I like to call the perfect storm. And the nosocomial infection is a hospital-acquired infection. So you go into the hospital with a broken leg and you end up with pneumonia. You didn't get pneumonia because you had it before you went in. You got pneumonia because you were exposed to pathogens that cause pneumonia while you were in the hospital. This, most, uh, this occurs um, because people are staying in the hospital. So there's another reason that hospitals don't like to admit people if they don't have to. They really don't want to admit you if you don't need to be admitted. Um, a lot of times you may think you or a loved one needed to be admitted, but the hospital saying, no, nope, you, you can get over this at home with this medication and this treatment. Um, and that's because staying in a hospital, it just opens you up. It is now, it's a predisposing factor and a pretty potent one at that because you're now being exposed to a whole host of pathogens all at the same time and you're in a weakened state. So about anywhere from five to 15% of hospital patients um, acquire nosocomial infections and that's a pretty high number. Uh, hospitals are encouraged uh, to prevent these infections and we'll talk about how the government has done that in a minute. So here on the right, I like to show this um, diagram, this Zen diagram, because it really drives home the point that nosocomial infections are almost unavoidable. We have here micro, microorganisms in the hospital environment. You are exposed, think about it, a hospital is a giant building full of people with all kinds of, um, with all kinds of different infections. So just by staying in the hospital, you are, being, you are possibly exposing yourself to a multitude of different bacteria and viruses and other pathogens. You're in the hospital because you're sick, which means you have a predisposing factor. So you're already immunologically compromised. No matter what the reason is, whether it's a broken leg or um, a heart attack or some, or some other type of infection, you are in a compromised state. Your immune system in your body um, is compromised. So now you're exposed to a whole bunch of crazy microorganisms you've never been exposed to before, and you're compromised. You can't get around and do anything yourself so all of the nurses and doctors and dietitians and physical therapists and everybody else involved in your care become a chain of transmission. So this is one of the reasons, not just for self-protection, but one of the reasons that PPE is so important, that um, washing hands and using the hand sanitizers, uh, gloves, gowns, isolation, all of those different things are all done to minimize the chain of transmission. And this is where hospitals do have a lot of control. They don't have a lot of control over the microorganisms that are in there. Patients come in with those. They also don't have control over the host being compromised. Um, that's just kind of the, na the, the name of the game in terms of healthcare. But what they can try to control is that chain of transmission. Now, in, um, uh, back in, in 2014, I think it was, when, uh, when Obama came out with Obamacare, 
recently came out with the um, Health Care Act or the HCA um, uh, 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 in, in the United States. So the new health care program, they call it Obamacare. The affordable, that's what, the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. So part of the Affordable Care Act, there were a couple of factors involved in, in paying for it. How were we going to pay for it? That was the big political question. And there are two major, major factors that played roles in how it was going to be paid for. The first was to boost the enrollment of young people. Young people are, do not have a severe disease. They don't go to the doctor as often. They're not hospitalized as often. So by having younger, uh, a large younger generation buying into the ACA, we could help support and offset the cost for the older generation that was also within the ACA. So that was the, the major part of it. But the second one was adjustments to Medicare and Medicaid. And those adjustments were not only in the co were cost adjustments, but they were also adjustments in what that Medicare and Medicaid would pay for. Now, it used to be if you got a nosocomial infection in the hospital, the hospital treated you and you your, you or your insurance company would get billed for that treatment. But the ACA Act, um, the ACA came back and said, you know what, if a patient is being treated for a nosocomial infection, Medicare and Medicaid will not pay for it and you can't charge the patient for it. So hospitals now had a monetary incentive to control the one portion of the nosocomial infection triangle that they could control and that's the chain of transmission. So hospitals have gone to some really big extremes to make sure that the chain of transmission um, gets broken in terms of disease to make sure that um, uh, patients are not getting nosocomial infections. I haven't seen any articles or anything on if it has been effective, um, but I know hospitals are spending a lot of money and doing a lot of training to make sure that nosocomial infections are reduced. And it seemed, um, uh, the federal government, Medicare and Medicaid is a big is a big payment for them. So they had to make sure that those numbers were reduced. So how often do nosocomial infections occur and what kind? You can see the number one type of nosocomial infection is a UTI. This is usually due to catheters. So a uh, catheter is up in the urethra. The urethra is not, is not sterile. Um, and so bacteria can build up within the catheter. Those bacteria are usually enteric bacteria and they are motile. So they can move up the catheter up into the urethra and cause um, upper and lower UTIs. Surgical site infections are, are a second, come in second place. Uh, and again, you've breached the skin. The, this is normal flora. This is an opportunistic infection where the staph aureus or the normal flora of the host comes back and begins to invade and grow along the wound from uh, the surgical site. Respiratory infections, uh, bacteremia because of catheterizations through IV, uh, skin infections, rashes, uh, those sorts of things, and then just a whole host of others. So the common causes of nosocomial infections, the most common cause are gram-positive cocci. We see those in surgical site infections, but we see gram-negative um, enterics in, um, in the uh, uh, urinary tract infection. C. diff is another very common, um, uh, when we're talking about organisms, is another very common. This is a gastrointestinal infection. It's usually due to multiple long-term use of antibiotics. Fungal infections are another difficult one to get rid of. They're often airborne. This can be um, a pneumocystis type infection, uh, respiratory or uh, uh, skin. The biggest problem we have is antibiotic resistance. So this is a huge range. It's upwards probably of the 60 to 70% of the gram positive cocci found in hospitals have some type of antibiotic resistance. It doesn't mean they're resistant to every antibiotic, but they're building resistance. And if you think about it, we have all of these different organisms all together in a hospital setting. You have a, a single healthcare worker who is picking up these organisms from one patient to the next. And so these organisms are coming into contact with each other in these very close quarters. And we have things like conjugation and transformation um, and uh, all of those sorts of things occurring in this really unique setting. When we talk about a disease that's an emerging infectious disease, of course, you know, we're in the middle of one right now, but these are diseases that are new. The term used for that is novel. 
Um, increasing in incidence, so it's one that um, that maybe was not around, was fairly rare, and now is coming back. That's why measles was consider, is now considered an emerging infectious disease because it was uh, very rare that people somebody got measles, but with the anti-vaccine movement now, the measles rates have increased dramatically. Um, or it could be showing a potential to increase in the near future. So this could be um, um, a disease that it's not, we're seeing it within a population in very low numbers. It's not warranting like an outbreak yet, but it's something that uh, due to due to lots of different cultural factors, societal factors, economic factors, health factors, all of those sorts of things. Um, an epidemiologist may consider it an emerging disease because it has the potential to increase in the near future. Uh, this is, uh, here could be, you could say, um, let's see, uh, uh, several years ago, probably about 10 years ago or so, uh, the pandemic team in the, in the federal government did say that they were concerned about certain viruses, particularly the SARS virus. They were concerned about the SARS virus making a comeback and that there was potential for that particular virus to come back and cause disease. So that would be um, uh, an emerging disease. There are multiple different factors that contribute to a disease being um, an emerging infectious disease. One is genetic recombination. Um, e. coli 0157, that enterohemorrhagic E. coli that uh, was discovered back in the mid 80s, uh, that was um, due to genetic recombination in E. coli. E. coli started there was a new strain of E. coli that started producing a toxin from Shigella. Another one is H5N1. This one hasn't totally hit yet, but it's an emerging, it uh, has the potential to increase, and this is a bird flu. Uh, there's been cases of it uh, uh, in China and South Korea over the past couple of years. Um, I, per, I actually have been following this particular flu virus for a while. Uh, just curious to see where it goes, but it um, pops up every once in a while. Then we have uh, evolution of new strains, Vibrio cholera. There was a new strain of it discovered back in the mid 90s, uh, early 2000s. And um, so it was a cholera, but it was a new type of cholera. And then we have inappropriate use. Now this includes antibiotics and pesticides because pesticides affect the vectors. So if we're using antibiotics incorrectly, then we are introducing or exposing bacteria to these antibiotics short term and the uh, organisms can begin to re kind of recognize it and be able to evolve and develop resistance to it. So if we have low level exposure of, of um, antibiotics to bacteria, they will eventually develop some kind of resistance to it. Other reasons that diseases are new or um, returning, we have changes in weather patterns. Hantavirus is a virus that is spread from uh, rat urine. So deer mice, uh, deer mice carry this virus. Uh, it's within their population. It does kill deer mice. But deer mice also need um, cool areas and water. So when there's a drought in areas like um, South, Southern California, over in the Midwest, when they have these big drought times, these deer mice will uh, start to house underneath porches and uh, cabins and housing areas in search for a cool place so they want to get in the shade and oftentimes pipes and other parts of the house there'll be condensation on those pipes and they can access water in that area so they will nest in underneath houses the problem is the virus the hantavirus shed in the feces and the urine of deer mice and so these deer mice they defecate and they pee um, in those areas away from their nest, but still under the house. And after that uh, feces and urine dries, it, it gets kind of a powdery form and people exposed to it will inhale the virus. The virus becomes airborne from, uh, from the dried up uh, uh, feces and, and urine from the deer mice. Yeah, Desreen, I know, interesting. Uh, then we have modern transportation. West Nile virus was discovered to move throughout the world because of modern transportation. People were getting on planes and going places. That's more than likely how we got COVID here in the United States. So modern transportation has played a huge role in the development of um, pandemics. Ecological disaster, uh, expanding human settlement. Um, you could have, we have a cholera in Haiti. They're still suffering from cholera 
Africa in Haiti after the earthquake because it destroyed their entire infrastructure and the people had to live in um, some pretty, pretty uh, uh, awful conditions. They didn't have any more sewers or anything like that. And so people then became exposed. So we have to live under these um, extreme conditions in ecological disasters. Animal control measures. We are vaccinating our, our dogs and cats against rabies. Um, of course, Lyme's disease is a tick-borne disease that's becoming a bigger problem here in the United States. Uh, encephalitis, which is transmitted by mosquitoes. I don't know about you guys, but I did live in Florida when we had the big encephalitis outbreak here in South Florida. And you used to be required to go into your house between uh, 5 and 7 p.m. because that's when the mosquito trucks were running around and spraying um, in areas to get rid of the mosquitoes. We, of course, have malaria, also spread by mosquitoes. And, uh, so we're trying to eradicate, not really eradicate the mosquitoes, but minimize the exposure to those mosquitoes so people don't uh, contract malaria. And then, of course, public health failure. Um, Diphtheria was traced back to um, a single water source back in New York City when there was a large diphtheria outbreak. Uh, pertussis measles, those are very recent outbreaks due to the anti-vaccine movement. And there was a listeria outbreak not too long ago, killed about 13 people, and that was a foodborne illness. And that was due to um, storage of cantaloupe, and the listeria grew on the cantaloupe. One big problem we have with uh, diseases is crossing the species barrier. That's what is believed to have happened with COVID, and this is what happens with the flu virus on a regular basis. Uh, we talked about genetic drift and shift, and oftentimes genetic shift is due to um, is due to crossing of the species barrier. So pigs are the big mixing vessel, particularly for the flu, and the reason for this is pigs physiologically are very very similar to humans. Um, their organs are of similar size and their uh, protein structure in such is very similar to our own. So pigs are very closely related to us on a genetic level. And yet they are also susceptible to um, not only human diseases because of their clo close pathophysiology with us, but also they're um, able to be infected by bird flus. So they're exposed to these bird flus, right? And so here we have H7N7 bird flu. And this bird leaves droppings or is in a pen or an open area where the, the pig is located and transmits the virus to the pig. So this pig gets infected with H7N7, H7N7. At the same time, this pig is on a farm. And so there's a human who has transmitted a human virus, right? The human flu virus, H3N3. So now we have the H3N3 virus also present. Um, and the pig gets infected with this virus. Now these are both flu viruses, but they're two different flu viruses. So the pig is now infected with two viruses, but it's also in a pen with a whole bunch of other pigs. And it also gets infected with H1N1. So now we have the perfect storm. We have a pig virus, a human virus, and a bird virus, all of the same viral family, all infecting a single pig, which means, um, and since the flu, all three of these strains of flu infect similar, uh, they infect similar tissue types, uh, the pig will have, it could have uh, one cell infected with all three of these viruses. Now, if you notice, the, the spikes, right, those glycoprotein spikes of viruses are what are most important for a virus to gain entry into the cell. If the virus doesn't have a spike that is complementary to the host, then it, the virus can't infect the host. It can't get inside of the cell. So what has happened here in this image is we have H1N1, right? We had H1N1, which is present. You can see the purple um, DNA here or RNA, I should say. So the H1N1 RNA is present inside of this virus. But this virus also contains the genes and produced spikes for bird flu, right? but also for human. So it could gain, into, get, gain entry into human. So now I have a, a human uh, transmissible virus. I have a virus that can be transmitted to humans, but it contains genes from H1N1 uh, H7N7 and H3N3. Uh, 
So I had have this new virus. I've never seen this virus before, but it has spikes. Um, yes, Jada, the, the pig is the mixing vessel. That's where the mixing pot is, for, particularly for the flu virus. But other animals can go through this process as well. So somewhere along the way, these viruses will evolve. And part of that evolutionary process is oftentimes um, an intermediate species. So in this case, the pig, um, its infection from H1N1 is really the biggest problem. But because it has receptors for the avian virus and the human virus, we get all three of them all mixed together in one single virus. We've never seen that before. And that's how H1N1, which had been around in pigs for 50, 60 years, started to show up in humans, was that somewhere along the way, some genes from a bird flu, some genes from a human flu, hooked up with a pig that was already infected with pig flu. And so those three flu viruses mixed together inside of some pig cells, and then it was transmitted back to a human. Now, when we look at epidemiology as a science, we look at a lot of graphs. Um, that's kind of an epidemiologist's best friend, and that's because looking at numbers is great, but it really, we need to graphically represent what is happening um, in terms of an outbreak or a pandemic. And all of you have probably become pros at looking looking at um, epidemiological curves and graphs right now. Uh, we do see quite a few of them on the news. But um, we use graphs to study where and when a disease occurs in a population because graphs are a great way to show us the trend, right? What is the trend in this particular um, this data or outbreak? So here in the bottom left, we have Lyme's disease by month. So here we're looking at simply um, incidence of Lyme's disease over a one-year period. And what we see is a trend. If we just looked at the numbers, it might not be as noticeable. But we see this big trend here where um, we see uh, the majority of new cases are showing up in July through October. Now, most Lyme disease cases occur in the uh, northeastern coastline, right, up in New England. We're talking Maryland, New Jersey, New York, New Hampshire, uh, Long Island, Island, uh, those uh, upper states in the New England area, the tick, the, the um, uh, Lone Star tick that transmits Lyme's disease is in a really high population up in those areas. So that's where the majority of Lyme's disease cases uh, occur. But what we're looking at here is the number of cases, right, a ratio uh, per 100,000. So we're looking at the incident rate. Now, why do you think that we see the majority of cases being diagnosed in July through October. What's going on in New England in July through October? I think in, in that time period, winter has, has kind of um, faded and more people are outside and interacting and within nature in, in that time of year. Exactly. So you have a lot of people outside, they're hiking, they're going to their cabin in the woods, those sorts of things. So they have a higher tick exposure. The greater tick exposure means higher risk for Lyme's disease because Lyme's disease is transmitted by ticks. But then we look at Lyme's disease, right? Now we're going to look at um, Lyme's disease uh, incidents over, what, uh, eight to over 12 years as opposed to one year. And so there's a big difference. Back in 92, we were looking about 10,000, right? 10,000 cases. Now we're looking up here in 2002, upwards of 24 to 25,000 cases. That's a huge increase. That's more than doubling the number of Lyme disease cases um, in less than in 10 years, which is pretty significant. So why do you think this case, we did a trend line, it would look like that. Why are the number of cases increasing? It's not seasonal. Anybody care to to take a guess? Yes, Jessica, it's an increase in development. So human development has introduced people 
there's a lot of factors, but him expanding human development. So people are moving more into wooded areas. Everybody wants their piece of the country. Um, there also was a, a large, in this time frame here, there was a lot of economic growth. So the country was going through a lot of economic growth. A lot of people were making a lot of money. There was a big housing boom. All of that contributes to expanding human settlement or development. People were buying second homes. They were buying larger homes out in wooded areas. Everybody wanted to uh, kind of get out of the city a little bit. Think about New England. And so they were now exposing themselves. We're moving more and more people into tick country, into area where areas where ticks are, so more people are exposed to ticks on a regular basis. So we increase in the incidence of uh, Lyme disease. Here in the bottom right, we have the opposite thing happening. Here we have a trend line that's moving downwards. We have a drastic decrease from 1948 to 2004. We have a major decrease in the number of, of TB cases, right? Now this is over, over a, a, what, a, almost 60 year period. Why do we have such a drastic reduction in tuberculosis over that time in the, in the U.S. population? Yeah, Desiree. Yes. I was vaccine. I was going. Yeah. Yeah, vaccines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have the introduction of vaccines up through, I think, around here into the 80s. And then we have introductions of boosters. So people receive TB boosters, and that um, helps to reduce the rate even more. But if you notice, even in 2004, we still had reported cases. Um, uh, and now that's per 100,000. So 10 cases per 100,000, that's still um, much too high of a rate for TB. Part of the reason for that tuberculosis is extremely contagious. Now, there are three people who are considered kind of the founders of the field of epidemiology. The first is John Snow. Uh, then we have Ignaz Semmelweis and Florence Nightingale. Now, John Snow, he mapped um, the cholera outbreak in London back in the 1800s. Um, he traced it back to, it was called the Bell Bar. It's called the Bell, I think. But he traced it all the way back to a water pump. Uh, in that was in the basement of a bar and that water pump was contaminated with cholera and so people that were getting their water from this pump were transmitting cholera to other parts of the city and he did this by mapping so he literally had a map of the city and he put little dots all over the city where cholera cases were being reported and what he noticed was there was a really large cluster around that one bar so he started testing areas near that bar and uh, in that bar, and that's when he discovered that the cholera was being transmitted uh, by that bar. So, so Snow was trying to go find the source. He was looking for the source of it. Semmelweis uh, did, carried out what's known as experimental epidemiology. So Semmelweis was, um, uh, he was a, a obstetrician and he was experimenting between, uh, I think we've talked about him already, kind of the, 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 um, uh, the 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 godfather of obstetrics, so to speak, um, and aseptic technique. He was actually um, an obstetrician, like I said, and he was delivering babies. And he noticed that if they washed their hands between deliveries and washed their instruments, that he could reduce the puerperal fever that was killing these mothers after childbirth. They were they had all kinds of crazy uterine infections because there was no hand washing occurring between patients. So he introduced the concept of hand washing and using antiseptics um, between patients to clean instruments and to clean your hands and any and using clean towels and sheets and those sorts of things to try and minimize the exposure to bacteria. And he was able to decrease puerperal fever from about 20% to less than one. Florence Nightingale, who is uh, the celebrated kind of um, overseer of nurses, uh, Florence, Florence Nightingale was trying to reduce um, epidemic typhus or typhoid fever that was occurring during World War I. And she did this by improving the sanitation in the hospitals, in the field hospitals where soldiers were being kept. They were losing more soldiers to uh, typhus in, in, from uh, typhoid fever and typhus disease than they were 
from actual injuries at war. So by improving the sanitation, she compared hospitals with good sanitation to hospitals with poor sanitation and was able to show that by improving or cleaning up certain hospitals, they could reduce the rate of um, what's known as epidemic typhus. So these guys created the three primary forms of epidemiology that are still used today. Uh, John Snow created what's called descriptive epidemiology. It's a type of study. So these are, you could say these are types of studies. So in a descriptive study, you would collect data and analyze it and look at where diseases are occurring and how they're occurring and then trace back to your kind of, um, your kind of patient zero, so to speak. Uh, Nightingale was comparing, so you compare a disease group to a healthy group, and so that's referred to as analytical, um, an analytical study. And then experimental is what Semmelweis did. Um, Semmelweis was using the analytical technique that, uh, similar to Nightingale, but Nightingale was using already existing disease groups and healthy groups. Semmelweis was creating them. So his form of analytical um, type of study is really more experimental. He was instituting um, an experiment to see if it worked. Uh, whereas Nightingale was taking already existing data. In case reporting, these are two new forms that um, have been introduced since then. We have, of course, case reporting where healthcare workers report uh, a list of different diseases to state and national offices. And these are reported usually on a weekly or monthly basis to the local departments to in turn will report it to state health departments and, and the CDC. And so the government collects all of this data on lots of different diseases because we want to watch these diseases in a population to see what's happening so that we can um, hopefully respond early enough to prevent rapid spreading of a disease. A nationally notifiable disease is one that a physician's office or a hospital, a healthcare worker is required by law to report. So here are uh, just some, these are the nationally notifiable diseases as of 2005. This, um, this list is much bigger now. You can see it's everything from um, um, AIDS all the way to toxic shock syndrome and beyond. So there are a lot of different uh, national notifiable diseases. You can see smallpox is still on the list. We would definitely want to know if that popped up again. Uh, Giardia, um, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, polio, of course, rabies in both animals and humans. There are a few diseases that veterinarians are also required by law to report. And the list goes on and on. Right? Yellow fever, meningococcus, uh, mumps, any diseases that we vaccinate against. Uh, Legionnaire's disease is usually a small outbreak, but it is required. Um, uh, Listeria, Lyme's disease, this would be both um, human and uh, veterinary. Malaria, measles, these are all diseases that are required by law. We want to know if these are present in, in the U.S. population. Now here in the United States, the CDC is, um, in, is responsible for collecting all of that data and putting it together, creating those graphs, monitoring where these different diseases are occurring within the United States. Um, and the CDC reports a couple of different things. We have, of course, what's known as the morbidity rate. The morbidity rate is the incidence of specific notifiable diseases. So how many people are getting this disease, right? So that's the morbidity rate. The mortality rate is how many people are dying from that disease. We are looking at morbidity and mortality on a daily basis right now, right? So um, COVID, we have a morbidity rate. Uh, we have um, a morbidity number. Uh, we don't really have it as a rate. And then we have uh, the mortality rate, which right now in COVID here in the U.S. is anywhere between 2 and 3% of the um, uh, cases. Then we have, um, well, that's the numbers are morbidity and mortality. The rates are usually the number of people uh, compared to the actual population. And then same thing with the mortality rate, the number of deaths from to the population of people with that disease in a given time. We'll go over and take a look at Hopkins and see where we're at on that in a minute. Now, the CDC publishes every week something called the MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It is free. You can subscribe to it. You get a copy of it every Sunday night. It is emailed to you. Um, it's a really great way to get, get kind of your finger on the pulse of epidemiology in the United States and kind of see what's happening um, around the U.S. There's oftentimes also reports uh, from MMWR from uh, other parts of the world. 
right now, of course, I'm sure it's that it's been dedicated pretty much to COVID, but they do talk about other types of diseases that are moving around as well. They are monitoring other diseases. They also um, give you the uh, kind of weekly report on all of the on uh, the big nationally notifiable diseases, rates and more mortality and morbidity numbers in those. So it is something you can go to um, the CDC and you can subscribe to it. You just need an email address. It's totally free. It's usually one or two pages. It's not particularly long uh, and it's really interesting and it always includes one case study. So there's always a case study that's part of it and it's a really great way to kind of um, just once a week take a look at a case study and, and um, read about it because they're always always really kind of interesting. So that's all we have on uh, epidemiology. I wanted to go to the house so we could look at some morbidity and um, mortality rates. So I'm gonna share that with you right now. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Desreen. Well, thank you for the lecture. Um, mm -hmm. I was just gonna say, so we're done for epidemiology. That's it. That's that's the end of the PowerPoint. Yes, yeah, so the end of the lecture. I was just gonna kind of drive home some of those uh, statistical points with uh, some of our current information on COVID. Okay. Um. So okay, we're gonna do that, and then so then that would be all for just just the lecture, so, I'm sorry. So that'll be all for the exam. Nope, Wednesday we do antibiotics. Oh. And then the oh, exam will oh, be over the weekend, like, yeah. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. why the lecture, okay, right. thank yep. you. Yep, okay. All right, so in our maps and trends here, we're at the Hopkins uh, Resource Center for Coronavirus. Uh, they seem to have the most extensive data. Um, everybody's been kind of reporting to them. This is through the Bloomberg uh, College of Health, which by the way, they're offering a couple of free Coursera courses on epidemiology if anybody is more interested. They are open to the public. They're totally free. They're excellent, excellent classes. Um, I've done a couple of uh, Bloomberg classes with these guys and they're amazing. Um, uh, you can really learn a lot in a really short period of time. So anyway, we can take a look at the map. Let's go ahead and look at the U.S. map since the United States is getting pr hit pretty hard. Uh, we are up to half a million cases. So our more our mortality is 547,627 cases. That is huge. That's a lot. Um, so we have half a, over half a million people infected. That's our mortality. If we were to talk about this in terms of mortality rate, we would have to we would look at this um, in terms in rates of the population of the United States, which is I want to say somewhere in the 60 million range. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, uh, we would just divide that by our population and that'll give us our mortality rate. Over here on the right, we have the total number of deaths. So the total number of deaths is 21,662. In terms of deaths to, uh, more, so morbidity to mortality ratio, our morbidity number is 21,000, um, but our morbidity rate would be the 21,662 divided by the half a million. So let me see, I'll go ahead and do that on my own calculator. Uh, 547627. So we're looking at about a 3.9%. So our mortality rate has actually increased. Our mortality rate was around 2.3%. It is now at 3.9%. We're upwards of a 4% mortality rate, which is pretty high. Um, and if you look at total recovered, we're at 33, about 33,000. Um, so out of the half a million, we do still have a greater recovery number than we do deaths, but our death rate has increased significantly. So we've gone um, from about a 2.4% 2. 2. Uh, mortality rate or a, a morbidity rate to a 3.9, uh, which is pretty high. You can see New York has the greatest number of deaths here. And so these are all um, uh, uh, the numbers for the different areas and it divides it into the counties, right? Nassau County, that kind of thing we can go down here. So let's see if we can't find Miami. Let me go back. Oh, 
go back to the US map. So those are the top 20 counties by death. Um, let's see if we can. I think if I click on, there we go. So here is Broward. Oh, wow, how lucky am I? Oops. I got right on Broward County. So here's Broward County. It's a little hard to read. I wish I could make that bigger. Oh, here we go. So here's Broward County, where we are. And it looks like this status report, I can't, it's really small, so I'm having a little trouble reading it. Let's see if we move through it. Oh, no, that's another county. So we have 2,900 confirmed cases and 76 deaths just here in Broward County. Um, let's see what we, if I can make this bigger. I don't know if that's bigger on yours, but we have 2,400 staffed beds. Um, we only have 233 ICU beds here in Broward County. So if we have 233 ICU beds, 76 of them are, I don't know how many of them are actually uh, taken by uh, COVID patients right now. 8.3% uh, poverty percentage. So about 8% of the people here are in poverty. And it's, it's right now they're seeing that, of course, COVID is affecting those areas um, of poverty the greatest. We have a total population in Broward County of just under a million people, so that's a that's a, a pretty good population. And so here on the left, we have different health facts. And then, of course, our population, race, and ethnicity is broken down here in this pie chart. So epidemiologists will take a look at all of these different um, all of this different data. Here we have 18,000 confirmed cases in Broward County. That's pretty high. So if we looked at our population, nine, I'm just gonna, nine, six, seven. So we're looking at a, just, just under 2% of the population in Broward County are confirmed. Imagine if we tested everyone, how much higher that number would get, right? Um, 461 total deaths, I'm not sure. Uh, what this number is from. I don't think we, I thought we only had 76 here from COVID. Fatality rate here is 2.46%. Um, so they're looking at, this is just kind of data uh, about the particular county. So we can start seeing, um, see if it pops up here. There we go. See, all I had to do was click on it. So when we compare statistics to the state of Florida, and here you can find all kinds of different information about the, the place that, you're, that you live in, right? So we have 2,945 confirmed cases and 76 deaths. And then all of this is just a different information about our population here in Broward County um, and uh, health facts, different types. Of, oh, health insurance here. These are all um, health insurance facts. That's a really high number. For no insurance. Um, that should not be the case. These, these people need to be insured. Um, so anyway, you can go in here and this is the kind of stuff that an epidemiologist would be looking at. Um, these are all predisposing factors, right? Uh, poverty is a predisposing factor. Um, age is a predisposing factor. Uh, uh, socioeconomic, um, race, ethnicity, those are sometimes predisposing factors as well. There's a lot of talk right now that um, that COVID is really hitting the African-American community much harder than it is other ethnicities. Why is that? What's going on in the African-American community that they're being harder hit? Is it gr a greater number of predisposing factors? Is it something physiological? Um, is it something which I, it, it is not? Um, what is happening in those areas and how can we stop that, that there's this disproportionate number of cases and deaths in one type of um, ethnic community than there is in another. And that definitely should not be the case. So how do we address that? Um, and those are the sorts of things that an epidemiologist would look at and say, okay, how do we address this and how do we correct it? Because this uh, should not be happening. So you can learn all kinds of crazy things about where you live. Um, and um, how diseases are moving through uh, different counties. Let's take a look at Dade County. Come on. Maybe I need to 
decrease this here. I seem to be stuck. Oh, you guys couldn't see the dashboard. Let me show that to you. I was able to enlarge it. I'm so sorry. Uh, I thought it was showing it to you. Yes, Desreen. Hi. Yes, I was I was listening, but we, we were just talking about um, predisposing factors and how they can make you more susceptible to the mm -hmm. uh, coronavirus. Um, I mean, if you've looked at other statistical studies on the African-American community, I uh -huh. mean, there, uh, there's more people with high cholesterol, there's more people with diabetes, there's more people with hypertension and other um, uh, other like you know side of uh, like um conditions that would uh -huh. make COVID nineteen you know take hold of you a little bit more. So yes, I mean we can't ignore that fact. You know no, no. So is that something? Um, we can't ignore that fact, and it's something that needs to be corrected. So how do we correct that? Why are is there more diabetes in that community? Why is there higher cholesterol and those sorts of things? What is happening in those communities that they are developing these pre-existing conditions, right? These um, um, these predisposing factors, how do we stop that? I, I mean, it's a very, it's a really sticky, complicated um, issue. And um, it goes back to, uh, it's some of it is cultural and some of it is socioeconomic. Um, the poverty level in the African-American community is far too high. Um, and so uh, in, the, in poverty level uh, communities, you have greater diabetes, you have a worse diet, people have to buy cheaper food, they can't buy as healthy food because it's much more expensive. It all comes back to um, a lot of socioeconomic factors that need to be corrected. And then when those get corrected, the trickle down effect of that is much greater. I know it's, it's, a, it's sometimes a, a touchy subject, but in terms of epidemiology, it's one that's um, of great concern. To epidemiologists, how do we correct yeah, that subject? And the reason, and because it is, that's why we have this problem. Yes, yes, and uh, it oftentimes does um, doesn't uh, people don't like to talk about it, right? They don't want to talk about it, but it is something that needs to be talked about in order for it to be corrected. So anyway, I did want to show you this kind of chart here. I'm trying to pull up the one on on Dade County. Anyone else want to add to that conversation? It's a it's an important one. So I just want to, I just pulled up here, um, just of interest, uh, Dave County. Hopefully uh, Dave County will show up now. Give it a second. There we go. So here we have Miami-Dade County. They have 7,000 cases with 97 deaths, um, and you can see there's um, uh, a much, we have a, a quite a different uh, 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 makeup, right? Ethnic, race, and ethnicity makeup in Dade County, very different. Um, we do have a much greater plus population. Look at this pop total population, 2 million, 2.7 million people in Miami-Dade County. That is huge. That's a large population. No wonder it's so crowded down here, right? 1.37% uh, fatality rate, and we still have this really high number of uninsured. Right? So our 65 plus are insured, but 19 to 34 years of age, which is um, our, our young population, you guys, but the greatest population without insurance is my age, right? This group right up here. Uh, 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 no insurance. That's a that's a really high number. Uh, this one right here. So people with no insurance. So seven seven percent of the population uh, does not have insurance in in terms of um, in that age group. 
which is the age group that tends to go to the doctor quite a bit. I mean, I know 65 plus is the most, but that's a really um, low number of uninsured uh, when you get into that. All right, does anybody have any other questions? Anything they want to look at? Victoria, how up to date is this? Um, it's my understanding that Hopkins updates their information several times a day in terms of COVID numbers. How up to date are these numbers probably based off the last census in terms of population numbers? Okay, because that VA healthcare, like the fact that it's at literally zero kind of surprises me. One, because we have a base in a VA hospital down south in Homestead, uh -huh. which is the day. And then uh, from my experience working in Miami-Dade, I mean, I get a lot of VA healthcare patients, like a lot, like a good amount. So I can't imagine it truly being at zero. Where are we at? Where I'm looking for the VA numbers. Oh, <laughs> VA healthcare. In terms of, in yes, but that's rates in terms of population. So these numbers here, right? So what percentage of the population is insured through VA? But that's like it's it's saying zero percent, right? It's like, saying zero point one. Okay. All right. So, so zero point two, and that's in the age group. So this top age group is the population of people from nineteen to thirty-four years of age that are insured through VA is zero point one percent of the population. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then zero point two percent are thirty-five to sixty-four. The zero point zero percent number right here. The 0, 0.0 is 65 plus. So that would be, it's not completely zero, but the mm -hmm. number, the percentage is so low that mm -hmm. it's less than one tenth of a percent. Yeah, I guess it's just, I, yeah. now that you look at it over a population of 2.7 million, it, it makes sense. That, but. Yeah, 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 because th that's VA only. And yeah. there's only one VA center and there's no, the other thing to remember is there's no VA center in Broward County. So any VA, any vets from Broward County have to go to Miami-Dade. They're not part of that population. Well, for the hospital, but they have VA clinics in Broward yeah, but County. They're, they and have too. VA clinics, right. They have VA clinics, but they don't have the hospital. So you're going to have a much greater number at the hospital of patients than you would at a VA clinic. Okay. Yeah. Let me take a look. Let me see what the number is in um, Dade in Broward County. Yeah, I'm looking at. I can look at those same numbers here in Broward County. Oh my God, they're so low. I can't get my pointer on it. And it's the same thing. 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and for the 65 and over, it's the same numbers. It's a little bit higher in Dade County than in Broward. Come on, there we go. Check. I was looking at date again. So Broward County, yeah, those numbers are still really low. But like Broward County, 35 to 64, there is 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and 0. Yep, same numbers in Broward County. Is 7,058 the morbidity or morbidity rate? I'm a little confused with what the difference is. Jalen. Uh, let me pull that number, 7,058. That's the morbidity. The morbidity rate would take 7,058 um, and divide it by the population, right? So a rate is a think of percentage. So what percent of the population? Basically, yes. So that's why when we look at deaths, so in here we're looking at Dade County, right? Yeah, I think we're in Dade County. So I would divide 97 by 7,058 to give me the mortality rate, the morbidity rate. I'm sorry, mortality. <laughs> I'll get it right. But the mortality number is 97. So it's just the current number of deaths or current number of confirmed cases. You're welcome. Does anybody have any other any other questions? Anything they wanted to look at or talk with talk about? All right, guys, so I'm going to stop the recording here.